it is a pleasure to welcome everyone uh, here this morning for our program on the United States, China, and Taiwan. I'm Jonathan Lowett, Deputy Vice President for Programs at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. Uh, and we are delighted to have this program uh, coming at a remarkably uh, timely moment. Uh, we are thinking of today's program as a briefing for congressional staff that members of the public and the subnational government uh, 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 staffers have been invited to attend and even participate in. And we hope that you will all ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, we are going a little bit against uh, our typical format in that today's, this morning's program is on the record. And so want to be clear for those uh, staffers who've joined us for past programs that are off the record, that this one is different. A goal of the National Committee's briefing series is to put a range of thoughtful ideas out there that add to the ongoing debates and discussions taking place in the public square, as well as in Congress uh, and elsewhere, in a desire uh, to have U.S. policy that's formulated in a way that is as well informed as it can be. Uh, this morning's speakers uh, represent their own perspectives, of course, uh, but the National Committee has to acknowledge at least that there are other valid perspectives out there. Today's program is to contribute to, the, to this uh, public debate. Now, uh, I'll allow today's moderator, uh, Dr. Shelley Rigger, to introduce our guests, but I'll just spend a moment uh, introducing her. Professor Rigger is the Brown Professor of East Asian Politics at Davidson College. She's been a visiting researcher and a visiting professor at universities in Taiwan and Shanghai and was a Fulbright a senior scholar based in Taipei just prior to COVID, working on a study of Taiwan's contributions to the PRC's economic takeoff and an investigation of Taiwanese youth. She's the author of two scholarly books on Taiwan's domestic politics, as well as a book for the general reader, Why Taiwan Matters. And I'm pleased to say she has a, a forthcoming book, The Tiger Leading the Dragon, How Taiwan Propelled China's Economic Rise, that is expected out uh, this summer. Uh, with that, I will turn uh, the microphone over to Dr. Rigger. Thank you so much for moderating the program. The mic is yours. Thanks. It is absolutely my pleasure to be with you today uh, with this magnificent audience and also the uh, wonderful panel of speakers always ready to do something for the National Committee. So welcome to all of you, to our speakers, to our audience, to the National Committee staff. And in particular, I am very excited to welcome the authors of this excellent new report, the United States, China, and Taiwan, a strategy to prevent war. Truly, what could be more important? Our speakers today are Ambassador Robert Blackwell. He is the Henry Kissinger Senior Fellow for US Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Dr. Philip Zelico, the White Burkett Miller Professor of History at the University of Virginia. Both of our speakers have served in foreign policy positions uh, both of them served in the George W. Bush, Bush administration and have held numerous other positions in academia and public service. And I invite you to uh, look at their longer bios in the event announcement for more information. But this is such an important report that I want to move immediately to uh, talking about it and dispense with any more preliminaries. So this report, the United States, China, and Taiwan, a strategy to prevent war is a deep and serious treatment of an urgent concern in US foreign policy, which is how to uphold US interests in the Taiwan Strait. I am an optimist on many things. My friends at the National Committee know that um, I'm sort of by nature an optimistic person. And I am an optimist, generally speaking, about Taiwan and its future. But if you are paying attention, it's hard not to be worried at this moment about where things are headed in the Taiwan Strait. 
the PRC has intensified all kinds of pressure on Taiwan, including military pressure and the Taiwanese government and Taiwanese citizens do not seem at all interested in accommodating the PRC's demands in ways that might diminish that pressure. Meanwhile, the US has been ramping up its support for Taiwan over the last uh, four plus years in partially in response to this increased pressure. So reading this report was especially sobering in the context of the news, but actually there's a lot in the report that goes beyond what most of us are reading in our daily press diet that um, is even more worrisome than maybe I was expecting to be. So it's very much worth our attention, especially the detailed concrete policy recommendations that are in this report. So let us move now to the author's presentations, first Ambassador Blackwell and then uh, Dr. Zelico, after which we will have some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you uh, and um, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in and thanks uh, for uh, the invitation uh, from the committee. Um, Philip and I are going to divide our presentations uh, and uh, I'll start off with three slides and discuss those briefly and then he'll discuss uh, four more and we look forward to the discussion. Uh, before I begin, uh, I'd like to uh, stress that although our presentation today it concerns the military dimensions of uh, the Taiwan issue, uh, the report uh, we did for the Council on Foreign Relations has 18 policy prescriptions and most of them are uh, devoted to strengthening U.S.-Taiwan ties across the board. Uh, economically, politically, uh, and diplomatically. Uh, so if you uh, have a chance, you might wanna look at those. Uh, so let me start on uh, my three slides. Of course, as we all know, there's a debate uh, about uh, whether, uh, I see we have the first slide up. There's a debate about uh, whether uh, Taiwan uh, deserves American uh, military uh, support beyond uh, weapons uh, and technology transfer should the United States use its own military force to defend Taiwan if China uses uh, uh, military force against Taiwan. Uh, there are a lot of opinions about this. Most folks uh, use uh, national interests in the context of discussing it, but do not indicate how they came to their conclusion, either that Taiwan is worth defending or not. Philip and I have uh, uh, thought about it and at least for your consideration, we have five vital national interests of the United States indicated on this slide, uh, but uh, we're very rigorous on uh, what these national interests are mo mo meant to do as you can see, to safeguard and en enhance Americans' survival in a free and secure nation. So a very rigorous definition. If you look at them, they'll be familiar to you. Uh, the first is prevent the use and reduce the threat of nuclear, biological, chemical weapons, catastrophic conventional terrorist attacks, cyber attacks against the U.S its forces abroad and its allies. The second, stop the spread of nuclear weapons and long range delivery system. Third is maintain a global regional balance of power and the strength of US alliance systems. Fourth, prevent the emergence of hostile major powers, fail states on our borders. And fifth, ensure the viability and stability of major global systems. Well, if you look at those five, it's pretty clear Taiwan doesn't have uh, much to do with one, two, four, or five. So that brings us to three, and especially the strength of U.S. alliance system. 
uh, and the issue arises as is now being debated, what is the relationship between Taiwan and the maintenance of our alliances? Uh, and uh, all we wanna say here, this is discussed uh, at length in the report, uh, all we wanna say here is that if you do believe that uh, Taiwan is a vital national interest because of uh, number three, uh, I think uh, you rely on a uh, domino theory approach. That is to say, Taiwan perhaps not intrinsically, but because of its effects on our alliance system. And that of course was, as you all know, the approach that led to dominoes uh, being asserted with respect to the war uh, in Vietnam. And uh, uh, that is a sobering thought. So that's slide number one. Slide number two is uh, the trends, and our moderator mentioned this, uh, uh, the trends for China regarding Taiwan are uh, very bad, as you know. Uh, uh, you can read through these, but the essence is that China has tried all sorts of approaches uh, from reaching out to uh, its current uh, coercive approaches, especially on the military side, and uh, their effect has been to harden uh, the view in Taiwan uh, for separation from the mainland. And if you were, as Philip and I tried to be, uh, imagining that uh, the, the uh, leadership in Beijing was considering these various trends, then uh, could they believe that uh, peaceful unification was any longer a realistic uh, option for China with respect to Taiwan? It is uh, difficult, at least analytically, for us uh, to uh, imagine very much optimism in uh, China about uh, peaceful unification because of all of these uh, uh, all of these factors, including uh, since we have uh, our friends from uh, uh, the congressional staff with us, the uh, strong support in the Congress uh, stronger than in decades. Uh, and that really is across American society. And then finally, we of course mentioned that the conceptual basis for peaceful unification, that is to say one country, two systems uh, is dead after uh, the Chinese oppression in Hong Kong. So that leads us to, uh, well, how likely is their conflict? Uh, between uh, uh, China and Taiwan, uh, triggered by a uh, Chinese attack uh, on Taiwan of one kind or another that Philip will discuss. Uh, I believe it's uh, fair to say that most experts uh, believe that China will not use force in the foreseeable future against Taiwan, and they enumerate a whole series of good reasons why uh, the stakes are too high and the price is too high for China, despite its frustrations and the trends that uh, I just discussed, uh, will uh, hold back. Uh, they will not uh, use force against Taiwan in the foreseeable future. Next slide, please. However, uh, we uh, would simply observe that most wars Come as, a come as a surprise except to those planning them. And the experts got every one of these wrong. In 1950, regarding China's entering the Korean War in 56, uh, with respect to uh, Suez in 62 and the Cuban Missile Crisis in 73 and the Yom Kippur War in 70, Soviet Union invading Afghanistan in 90, uh, most experts thought uh, Iraq would not invade Kuwait. In 2014, most experts thought Russia would not invade Ukraine. And finally, we say in 20X, most experts dismissed the possibility that China would use force against Taiwan. Uh, by the way, it is an intriguing question why experts are wrong 
in all of these occasions, but that is the subject of another discussion. So with that, uh, let me conclude by saying we're not predicting war, but Philip is going to now uh, be specific about the various uh, options that uh, China might have and the various options that the US might have to respond. Over to Philip. Uh, great, thanks, Bob. Um, so when we look at the uh, danger of conflict, um, most people tend to think of this as, well, it's China invading Taiwan or it's um, cyber harassment, things like that. What we then did is we broke out and analyzed what we thought were the three most um, interesting sets of scenarios. Uh, that China might invade Taiwan's periphery, but not Taiwan itself. That China might quarantine Taiwan. That China might invade Taiwan. Let's first just look a little bit more at what do we mean by invading Taiwan's periphery. Next slide. So uh, here's a map. Taiwan uh, uh, claims control of several offshore islands. There are populated islands like uh, the Pescadores, uh, Penghu, uh, Kinmen and Matsu, just off the coast of mainland China, which was an object of confrontation in the 1950s, Taiwan Straits crises. Um, these are populated islands. It would be um, uh, messy to uh, try to attack them, but that's a possibility. There is an island that's further south off this map in the South China Sea that's of some possible interest that Taiwan claims. But one uh, atoll, which few people have heard of, but that is currently uh, uh, contested, is this one right here, Pratas. It's an atoll that actually doesn't have an indigenous population, except right now it's being occupied by several hundred uh, Taiwan soldiers and Marines. And the Chinese military activity around Pratas is intense. Its, uh, its location is interesting to China because as you see, it's kind of midway between Hong Kong and their bases in Hainan and the Luzon Strait and Bashi Channel, which is one of the great outlets to the deep Pacific. So our point about to uh, go back to the previous slide for a moment. Our point about the periphery scenario in our report is that although you can work up a scenario in which they do these things, there is a little bit of a question of what exactly does this accomplish for China if they did this? It would certainly, uh, the theory as well, that Taiwan, Taiwan will be so frightened and intimidated by this that then they'll kowtow to China. Um, that's possible, but it's perhaps uh, more likely uh, that it will mobilize Taiwan in even more fervent hostility against mainland China. It will frighten and alarm the world. It will polarize the situation and actually maybe increase Taiwan's resistance. Um, in other words, it can make matters worse for China without actually addressing the underlying problem. But the Chinese might not see it that way. So then you come to the second scenario we have here, which is a Chinese quarantine of Taiwan. But quarantine, by the way, we don't think the most interesting scenario here is a blockade in which China tries to cut off um, uh, food and ordinary passenger traffic. We think instead what China would be more likely to do in this scenario is simply to establish that it gets to control who comes and goes from Taiwan. And it would do that, arguing that the Americans are sending, are planning to sell hundreds of advanced missiles to Taiwan and that China is now not going to allow this foreign power on the other side of the world to send hundreds of missiles to the territory it claims as part of China. From the Chinese argument then, it would be as if this was a Cuban Missile Crisis in reverse, the Cuban Missile Crisis in which the United States blockaded Cuba to keep Soviet missiles from being shipped into Cuba, claiming that was dangerous. The Chinese would run the argument the other way, saying we won't allow American missiles or other munitions to come into Taiwan or American advisors. And to do that, what we're going to do is we're simply going to establish a naval and air screen around the island. And if we see any ships or aircraft that we regard as suspicious, we will order them to divert to the mainland for customs clearance. 
Uh, this means they don't have to interfere with the daily shipments of food and ordinary trade. They don't have to interfere with the daily ferry traffic back and forth between Taiwan and the mainland. But it would conclusively establish um, that Taiwan's uh, um, role as an, inter, as, an, as, an, as, an, as an autonomous international gateway was now firmly under Chinese control and that Chinese get to decide who comes and goes. And that could have some large consequences. Um, this is a challenging scenario uh, for, the, uh, for friends of Taiwan. Third scenario, of course, is the classic invasion scenario. The invasion scenario runs in two main forms. Sorry, the invasion scenario runs in two main forms. The first of these is um, the traditional siege and amphibious assault. Um, this is an intrinsically difficult operation, but not impossible. And our report has some analysis of this. The second scenario, which a number of commentators are increasingly calling out, is more of a uh, strike from above, using special operations forces, airborne and heliborne forces, missile attacks, to decapitate uh, Taiwan's defenses, open up airfields and harbors, and allow the Chinese to bring troops in in that way. Uh, that, and that is certainly a dangerous scenario. So in each of these scenarios, one would work through how the United States would try, would prepare to respond in order to try to prevent an attack. Let's go to the next slide and the next. So we uh, find four basic approaches the United States has adopted or could adopt in order to um, approach Taiwan and the defense problem. Four basic options. The first option is that the United States would simply say, um, we're not going to plan on a direct US defense of Taiwan. Taiwan is not in our defense perimeter. This would uh, simply say, uh, you know, we hope that Taiwan and China can work things out. We wish Taiwan well, and we'll do what we can to help them. But fundamentally, uh, the United States is not going to defend Taiwan. Uh, we renounced the defense treaty in the 1970s, and we're not going to renew it. Uh, if you want to see a version of this, this is not the administration's policy. This is not what we recommend. But it is an option. If you want to see a defense of that option, there's an article right now on the Foreign Affairs website explaining this option from Charlie Glazer. Second option, um, do not commit in advance to the direct US defense of Taiwan. But nonetheless, plan as if the US might do it. In this option, it's unclear exactly how the US would go about doing it. Also unclear <clears throat> is what role Japan or other allies would play in some defense of Taiwan. And it's especially unclear because none of this is rehearsed or exercised. And third uh, un unclear area is unclear if the United States did come to Taiwan def defense, would the def US defense plans involve attacks into the Chinese mainland? which would be logical targets if the Chinese mainland is the source of the attacks on Taiwan. This second option that we describe here is we think an accurate description of the status quo and the, and the current Biden administration approach and the historic approach. A third option, however, which some people refer to as strategic clarity is that the United States would commit, plan and prepare to share responsibility for the direct defense of Taiwan. We would, uh, we would go back <clears throat> to the defense commitment that we abandoned in the 1970s. The people who work on these options do assume that the United States would have to target um, Chinese tar targets in the Chinese mainland, which would open the war to a general war between the United States and China. Uh, we believe actually the Trump administration came very close to uh, adopting this third option, especially in its last year. And I'll add that during its last year, this uh, situation became actually pretty dangerous, perhaps more dangerous than people know. 
The uh, third option to us strikes us a little bit as um, reminiscent of the strategy of Douglas MacArthur in the Korean War. Uh, the two things that are reminiscent to us about MacArthur in 1950-51, for those of you who are students of that history, is one um, really quite, in our view, a radical underestimation of the Chinese and what they might do. And two, um, a casualness in the possibility and uh, in the possibility of a general war between the United States and China and how that would unfold. Um, the fourth option is that um, is to stick with the status quo uh, with its lack of clarity, but at the same time, prepare and rehearse, and I'll stress rehearse, a parallel allied plan that could challenge a Chinese denial of access and ship defense supplies to Taiwan. This fourth option is what Bob and I propose. So let's go to the next slide to just give you a little more detail about what goes into that option. So you can see some of the key choices that we're recommending. So the top, at the top here is a restatement of the option, the parallel allied plan. We stress this word allied. And uh, by allied, we mean at a minimum, the United States and Japan. Call out then three things about this option. First, the plan should place the burden on China to widen the war. That is, if China is engaged in a limited war against Taiwan and the United States seeks to a challenge of Chinese denial of access by steaming or flying to Taiwan. In this plan, rather than simply joining in Taiwan's defense and attacking, the, and attacking Chinese forces that are engaged in the war, the United States and its allies would oblige the Chinese to be the ones who initiate a conflict against the United States and Japan. Second, even if China attacks allies like the United States and Japan near Taiwan. This plan would not assume that such a war should extend to the Chinese mainland, with all the consequences that that might invite for the war to also extend for, to the American mainland, um, uh, a fictional illustration of which was recently published in the book Jim Stavridis just wrote called 2034. Third, instead, our version of escalation in, our, in this option would be that if China was widening the war, the United States would pre have prepared visibly and in advance for, uh, to do a whole series of things that would happen in such a limited war, to break economic relations, remilitarize Japan, which would be Japanese plans, and prepare the US seriously for a general war. Our point it's worth stressing is we believe those plans need to be drawn up before the crisis so that it's visible to the Chinese that the Americans and the Japanese are preparing for these kinds of consequences in the event of a limited war. We believe in reality, a limited war would produce an immediate break in all economic and financial relations, the seizure of assets, everything else immediately creating a global economic crisis. We think in fact that that is realistic in the event of a limited war. It is not realistic, however, to threaten to do all these things simply as sanctions. Hence the importance of developing a plan that puts the burden on China, to decide whether to widen a war that then would trigger these plans that would be prepared, be prepared in advance so they might deter China from starting a war in the first place which is of course the objective underneath all of this is we're trying to prevent any war at all. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so now we are gonna move to some questions and answers. I found one thing that I found really interesting in this report is the, the way that Taiwan itself plays into the considerations and, and calculus that's, that's here. Uh, and and it, 
the, you know, the purpose of the report is to provide policy advice to the US. And so understandably, um, the role of Taiwan policy or Taiwan's own domestic politics is not in the foreground of, of the paper for very good reasons. But it is kind of interesting to think about what role Taiwan might play in shaping events as we potentially move in the direction that Ambassador Blackwell and Dr. Zellico have described. So to that end, I wanted to ask a question um, to start things off. Uh, it's a kind of a subtle point um, and it may just be purely rhetorical, but perhaps there's something to it. This idea that you begin with in the early in the report that the Taiwan Strait is the most dangerous place or the biggest flashpoint in the Asia Pacific, East Asia, the world today, um, it's, it's come to be a bit of a cliche, right? Taiwan is the flashpoint in Asia. People have been saying this for decades and it definitely makes a certain kind of sense. I understand why people identify Taiwan as a flashpoint. Um, and identifying Taiwan as a flashpoint reads two-sided. There's a Taiwan Strait and it's dangerous because there are entities on both sides that don't get along and there could be an armed conflict between them as a result. And I'm just wondering if that's still true. Um, is this a two-sided conflict today or is what we're seeing now really the PRC more unilaterally deciding to make the Taiwan Strait dangerous? In which case, would it make sense for us to shift from the rhetoric of the Taiwan Strait is a flashpoint to something along the lines of, you know, the Taiwan Strait is the place in which the Chinese leadership is most likely to use military force to advance its objective of expanding its territorial reach and extending its hard power in the region. So I guess what I'm really asking is, you know, how much of a role do you think Taiwan plays in the trends that we are seeing as opposed to the PRC making decisions that are uh, to a greater extent maybe than has been true in the past, independent of Taiwan's actions? Maybe I'll start uh, and I think it can be brief. First of all, we're not wedded to the metaphor. Uh, and I think a debate about how dangerous it is, well, is it a seven on a 10 point scale or an eight or a six or a five? It's, uh, as we tried to show in our presentation, dangerous enough that responsible uh, American administrations should prepare for a Chinese, the possibility of a Chinese uh, attack uh, on Taiwan and have a clear notion of how it would respond that it would present to the president in such a circumstance. I wanna say in that regard, before I get to the Taiwan uh, issue uh, with respect to Taiwan itself, that uh, I was struck today in reading through, and many of you perhaps looked at it this morning of the almost moment by moment uh, enumeration of the planning for uh, the attack on Osama bin Laden and almost minute by minute, what I was struck by thinking about our uh, session today was uh, President Obama continuing to ask the US military, can you do it? And I just wanna say what is often not uh, addressed in the debate on this issue is to try to answer the president's inevitable question uh, and Philip and I have both been in the White House more than once, uh, uh, the president's inevitable question to the American military, can you do it? And uh, that needs to be addressed presumably uh, to reach a, uh, a sensible position. On Taiwan itself, I just wanna say this, uh, uh, with, and this is uh, uh, enumerated in Philip and my uh, report and our piece, in War on the Rocks, which followed it up, we would go if um, uh, our approach uh, were uh, adopted to first to the Taiwanese and say, 
uh, here's how we intend to uh, uh, promote stronger deterrence. What do you think? And here's your role. And if you don't like this approach, what approach do you like better? And we've had that conversation and be open to their ideas. Then we would go to Tokyo, exactly the same approach. This is how we would propose to strengthen deterrence. Uh, what's your reaction? Because uh, we need, obviously, the Taiwan government and the uh, Japanese government and others, perhaps, the Australians, uh, to sign on to this approach. So it's a consultative process. This is not presenting them with the code of Hammurabi here, uh, which can't be moderated any, in any way. I'll only add to that, um, Dr. Rigger, your question was, I think you were troubled that people refer to a Taiwan Straits flashpoint with sort of a passive voice, as if implying both sides are equally at fault. And I think the, um, the premise of your argument is Taiwan hasn't really done anything to promote pr to provoke this crisis. This crisis is really being provoked by one side and our language surrounding this therefore shouldn't be quite so passive. Um, we have, I think, substantively have no disagreement with your reading of the situation and our report, I think, makes that clear. We do not blame Taiwan uh, for the current crisis, but, but we know the Chinese do. And we've had conversations directly with the Chinese in which they could not be clearer on this point. And we then say, like, we think actually a President Tsai has tried to be very careful and prudent and measured. Um, that, that is, whether or not they actually believe their rhetoric, their rhetoric is that that is not the case. So, um, that then just leaves us with the practical problems that Bob and I have tried to address. Um, but I do want to stress that uh, we, do, we don't disagree with you in your underlying reading. We, we just, it just is not very helpful for us in a practical way to come to work through this policy analysis based on you know, who we think is at fault. Uh, we still have a that still leaves you with the problems that you have to solve to try to prevent a war. Sure, that makes complete sense. I'm, I guess what I'm just thinking about is uh, more broadly this sort of cliche of you know the Taiwan Strait is this dangerous flashpoint. Maybe we should all reconsider um, using that kind of phrasing as the uh, as a sort of balance of threat shifts more in the direction of the PRC. Um, another question that I, I had that is again, a little maybe outside the, the frame is in when you define US interest, and thank you very much for including that in your PowerPoint and in your report, because I'm always looking for statements of US interest to give to my students so that they can understand how difficult it is actually to define what the core interests of any nation, including our own, actually are. Um, but in that statement of US interest, you mentioned preventing the use of military force against the US and its allies, which completely makes sense. But as I thought about it, it occurred to me that um, I wonder whether prioritizing alliances in this way is a little arbitrary. What is it other than historical accident that differentiates Japan and the Republic of Korea from Taiwan? You know, what makes them US allies and Taiwan not a US ally other than the sort of path dependent um, developments over the decades? And if the rationale for alliances is to protect partners who share our values and strategic interests, why would we differentiate between Taiwan and other nations? So I guess my question is, why should the U.S. define its interest in terms of alliances? You know, we don't have an alliance with Mexico, but that me doesn't mean we're any less interested in preserving its independence from a hostile power. And if we were to uh, reconsider the sort of priority that we give to formal alliances, might that elevate uh, Taiwan in the sort of um, strategic 
value structure of the United States? I can answer that quickly and Philip may want to chime in, but uh, what uh, differentiates alliances, you mentioned Japan and South Korea, is that we have solemn defense, formal treaties with them. Well, um, rather than get in an argument about the relative economic importance of Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, um, Bob's point about the treaty is not just a semantic argument. Um, the reason it matters is because uh, the American people through its representatives solemnly debated whether they would go to war, go to war to protect this country. War is a big deal. Um, both of us have some personal connection to this. It's not an abstraction to us. And, and this is me, you know, the question is, uh, who should make that decision? If the Congress, if the president and the Congress want to decide to commit the United States of America to go to war for another country, then there should be, um, I think there should be a political debate about that and it should be decided according to the processes of the Republic in some fashion. Um, that's uh, um, especially in a case like this, where uh, um, even the effort to do this might itself prompt the war. Um, uh, there, uh, by the way, there and there are congressmen who are proposing this. There is a Taiwan Defense Act that was proposed in Congress last year by Senator Hawley of Missouri. Um, there are other pieces of legislation that are similar that will be put forward in this Congress. If uh, the president and the Congress want to support that bill, um, let's have the public debate about it. So that's point one. But the second point is um, it's really a good idea not to write checks unless you think you have money in the bank to, to, to back them, especially if you put the full faith and credit of the United States behind the check, which comes back to the question that Bob raised a little bit earlier about the question the president is going to ask. Um, but there is an alternative argument. The alternative argument is that we should commit our full faith and credit to this defense. We should mobilize the United States and its defenses to do this. We should seek the support of the American people for this commitment. And if we do all those things and make a maximum effort, it might work and that we should do that. Uh, there is another question as to in the interim, in the years of getting ready to be able to defend Taiwan confidently, what is the China, what does China do in the interim? Thank you. I think that's a really important answer because many times our friends in Taiwan uh, don't don't necessarily understand the U.S. process of alliance making and the sort of solemnity of those commitments, and imagine that um, it's a little easier than. By the way, we did this with Taiwan before. Yeah. We had a treaty undertaken and formally ratified a treaty which we then also through a political process tore down and replaced with a Taiwan Relations Act that was adopted in 78 and 79. And so if, if the United States wants to reconsider that and, and reverse that through its political processes, we, we know how to do it. Okay, thank you. So I wanna to turn to some uh, questions from the audience. We have a, a question from Mercedes Trent. How effective are softer for forms of deterrence, such as strong people-to-people -people ties, integration into the international community, and economic relations? In other words, do those kinds of things raise the political and perhaps economic costs to China high enough to actually affect Beijing's decision-making on this issue, do you think? Philip? Yeah. Um, actually, the Chinese make this argument. And their argument is, if only more Taiwanese would come to China and visit China and discover what a wonderful country we have, then that might ameliorate some of the hostility that divides us. That is their argument. Um, if you've spent, Dr. Rigger, quite a lot of time in Taiwan. And uh, you've probably even talked to one or two Taiwanese who've been to mainland China. Um, they, they have a different take on that dialogue. So um, there is a Chinese argument that more people to people contacts will somehow ameliorate this artificial hostility. 
Uh, many Taiwanese who've spent time in mainland China and watch it closely have just the opposite of working. Uh, I think uh, try to, we can't be sure, of course, about what will defer uh, uh, China uh, if it considers attacking Taiwan. I, uh, however, uh, would be surprised if the issue of uh, uh, Taiwan's links with the outside world uh, had uh, much effect on uh, the PLA's advice uh, on this matter. Uh, we, uh, in the report, strongly support uh, more people-to-people -people ties between the United States and Taiwan and between Taiwan and other democracies. But that's because uh, of our values, not because we think that that will increase deterrence if China seriously considers using force. These are ruthless people over in at the top of the government in Beijing, and I don't think they'll be affected uh, by those uh, other factors. We do actually have this recent little experiment we've conducted on this theory called, and the experiment is called Hong Kong. Ah, uh, 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 tragedy for another day. So another question from Bob D'Souza, how do the scenarios change if the first act is the Republic of China declaring itself an independent country? Oh, if they declare themselves an independent country, uh, we believe that will cross a Chinese red line and make war likely, uh, very quickly. Yeah. And, uh, but I think the government of Taiwan um, perfectly well understands this. The Chinese argument, therefore, is that uh, the Americans should not do things that will encourage Taiwan to um, feel enabled to make such provocative moves. Uh, that we, and that therefore, if the United States basically made a defense commitment and uh, guaranteed Taiwan security, Taiwan, the Taiwan leadership would now feel liberated to do what would otherwise be unthinkable. That's, which is why the, uh, our, the Director of National Intelligence of Real Haines uh, testified yesterday that China would find um, an American move towards, quote, strategic clarity to be, as she put it, deeply destabilizing. And then uh, they would presumably react to that. Thank you. Uh, uh, two questions that are sort of coming from opposite directions, one from Aaron Finley, the other from uh, Rod Ozama. These refer to other players besides the US. Uh, Aaron Finley asks, is the newly invigorated Quad increasing tensions and pushing China to be more aggressive? And Rod Azama asks about US allies. Can US allies, what role can US allies like Japan, South Korea, and the Philippines play in helping to diffuse tensions and prevent war? So I guess, how do, what do you think about the role of these more robust alliances in either increasing the pressure on China and potentially making it more aggressive or helping to relieve the pressures and tensions in the region? Well, I'll, I'll, I suggest I'll do the quad and then Philip can follow on the question of the alliances, the role of the allies. Simply about the Quad is, of course, the Chinese don't like the Quad, and they make that clear. Uh, well, what's the Quad done so far? Uh, as far as I know, uh, it's only action they've all agreed on has to do with providing vaccine to countries that otherwise would not be able to acquire it in a timely way. This doesn't seem to me to be a highly provocative act. It's an act for the public, the international public good. I don't think uh, at the moment that the Quad uh, will have an important effect on China's view of Taiwan. We'll see how the Quad develops. Uh, I think it'll be very slow is my own view, uh, not least because of the Indian view, uh, which is uh, uh, hesitant uh, about uh, expanding uh, to security the, uh, uh, the agenda of the Quad. So, I think the Quad is at the periphery of the question of uh, China's view of uh, the evolution in Taiwan uh, and uh, wouldn't affect it very much. The, uh, um, 
the point about uh, views of other allies and how might they how, they how they might help is true, but I want to emphasize, as Bob will too, we mainly are thinking here about Japan. Uh, maybe Australia plays a, a, a role too. But the questioner was mentioning countries like South Korea and the Philippines. And there's an image that Americans may have that our allies are like some block. They are not. Um, the Philippines have quite different interests. They are, uh, they are not committed or engaged on the Taiwan issue at all, really. Um, though they're very interested in the South China Sea issue is a separate matter. South Korea is, uh, I think, not only not engaged on the Taiwan issue, it, it, it positively wants to stay away from it. And, um, and is very worried that any conflict that occurs sort of uh, in that inner area um, or around or the Taiwan Straits and between Japan, that whole part of the world would, could have a dramatic effect on South Korean commerce, um, which is highly vulnerable to maritime disruption, though no country is more vulnerable or no area is more vulnerable to maritime disruption than Taiwan itself. So two questions here on the role of U.S. interactions, U.S. official interactions with uh, Taiwan. The first from our president, Steve Orlands, uh, how is, is U.S. government, is the U.S. government increasing risk by strengthening official contacts with Taiwan? Um, the Chinese government views these interactions as a violation of the terms of the establishment of diplomatic relations between the U.S. and the PRC. So are there ways to strengthen the U.S.-Taiwan relationship without uh, increasing official contacts in a way that might provoke a backlash from the PRC side? And then a second question, since we have two speakers, we can have two questions in this category. Um, what about how can the U.S. help Taiwan prepare for the possibility of military aggression. This question coming from Maggie Lewis. Um, you know, what can the U.S. do in addition to developing a stronger all-volunteer army in Taiwan to help Taiwan figure out what preparations it should be taking to make its society ready for the possibility of military conflict? Again, I suggest I'll take the first and leave the second one, with Philip, but you may chime in on the first as well. Uh, uh, on, on the question of contact and uh, U.S. contacts with Taiwan representatives, as uh, we know, uh, this was expanded uh, in the Trump administration, and essentially the Biden administration has adopted the approach of the Trump administration. Uh, they are uh, regulating uh, uh, it but only ma uh, mildly regulating uh, contacts between uh, Taiwan officials and the Biden administration. So this, uh, this is uh, uh, a, uh, 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 an issue and a position that the Biden administration inherited. Uh, they uh, so far, so far uh, have not moved uh, the Biden administration up to contacts uh, in Taiwan by visiting Americans in the security domain. And we'll see if that happens. Uh, in the report, we, think, we say we think that would be a mistake. And of course, uh, they edged, the Biden administration edged up to that, uh, just this side of that by sending two former deputy secretaries of state there. Uh, but so far, uh, they, uh, that's the space to watch. Uh, we believe that it's perfectly legitimate for the United, for the Biden administration to send, for example, its uh, uh, cabinet uh, secretary on health to discuss uh, pandemics in Taiwan. After all, Taiwan has been one of the most successful countries uh, on earth in dealing with COVID uh, and so forth and uh, trade issues as well. But I think uh, we believe that uh, we should stay away from security contacts uh, between uh, the, the United States and uh, Taiwan officials uh, in Taiwan 
uh, visiting American senior officials in the security domain. Yeah, and the uh, as the part of the question about is there more that can be done to help Taiwan defend itself? Yes. And Taiwan leaders, a lot of Taiwan leaders know what that agenda is. Usually experts refer to this with labels like asymmetrical defense. Instead of shiny big ticket items that actually um, d are not that uh, dangerous, uh, this is an agenda in which you use um, lots of decentralized missiles and sensors to make it very difficult for China to gain air superiority over the island and to make it very difficult for China to launch that quick, easy decapitating attack. Um, this is doable in theory for Taiwan. Um, most experts don't think Taiwan is there yet. In fact, there is a sense that for a long time, Taiwan was pretty complacent about its security situation, abolishing conscription and the rest. I mean, Taiwan doesn't look at all like Israel or even Switzerland. So there's a lot, if, the Taiwan, if Taiwan really wants to show it's going to do everything it can to remain independent, there are a lot of military things they can do. Americans and others have, have talked to them about that agenda and a lot of Taiwan's leaders get it. And they have begun moving there in the last two or three years. Uh, and there's a lot more that can be done that would be very useful. And that can be done without the United States stepping in with a heavy footprint to say, we'll take care of it, which actually could be counterproductive in every way. Let me just add that uh, uh, on the issue of uh, Taiwan, as Philip just said, acquiring the capability to maintain its separation from uh, the mainland. Uh, as Philip said, uh, I think very, very few US experts believe they have that capability now. And uh, the usual uh, timeline for them to acquire that capability is three to five years if both sides work very hard on it uh, in a disciplined and, uh, and comprehensive way that perhaps in three to five years, Taiwan would have that capability, although one does have to ask, what are the Chinese doing during that period? But the, I raise this to make this point again about the president faced with a Chinese attack on uh, Taiwan of one kind or another. I think he will not be satisfied when he asks, well, can you do it with the answer Mr. President, not now, but we'll be able to do it in a couple of years. So uh, the period between now and when uh, Taiwan has that capability, which we very much support in the report, could be viewed as Philip said earlier, as quite dangerous because what is China going to do? Sit on its hands while it uh, watches Taiwan acquire the capability to defend itself in the way Phillips described. Again, that leads us to think we're in a particularly dangerous period. Which is why it's so important for everyone to try to avoid, do everything possible to avoid a confrontation and uh, speak softly. So we are out of time. We are passed out of time and I see the number of participants diminishing. So I will just say thank you very much for this fascinating discussion and for your very important report. I hope everyone will read it. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Jonathan Lowett to close us out. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, I really wanna give my sincere thanks first uh, to today's moderator and speakers for a most provocative uh, an excellent program. Second, to all the members of the audience for taking time to join us this morning. Uh, and third, to my colleagues who labored to make this program possible. I'd be remiss if uh, we closed without giving one final plug to the Blackwell Zellico CFR report. Uh, for those thinking about US policy towards China and the region, it's, uh, it's a must read. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we look forward for the congressional staffers to seeing you again uh, next month uh, for a program about uh, climate uh, with announcements that will be forthcoming. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, enjoy your afternoon and the weekend.
Thank you.